Hey, David here. I'm your Uber. Uber operates at a massive scale, and in order to support everything, they have thousands of microservices processing requests every second. Today, we will be talking about their service mesh architecture that has been powering their mission-critical services since 2016. A service mesh is a layer of infrastructure that allows microservices to communicate with each other without knowing the infrastructure details of other services. When a microservice needs to communicate with another, all it needs are the destination service name, procedure, and the request. The service mesh will take care of other things such as service discovery, we'll explain this shortly, load balancing, ensure backend instances are processing similar amount of requests, traffic shaping, help avoid directing traffic to specific zones or clusters, this is useful for when an outage happens, looking at you US East 1, Observability, provide insight into request latencies, request patterns, etc. Reliability, provide features such as rate limiting, throttling, etc. Uber operates at such a large scale that they have to host their infrastructure across multiple regions among their on-prem data centers and public cloud providers like AWS. The control plane components, which manage the overall system using various specialized subcomponents, are distributed across different availability zones within each region. The first subcomponent is the traffic control system. This system serves as the central orchestrator of the entire service mesh architecture. It acts as the central decision maker, producing traffic assignments that tells the proxies how traffic should be distributed among the backend instances. Also to subscribe, look how cute he is. It also provides other configuration options such as avoiding certain instant pools or rerouting traffic from one region to another in the event of failure. The discovery system interacts with the cluster management to locate all the available and latest instances associated with a particular service to ensure that requests are routed to the latest version of the instance. It can also remove any unhealthy nodes from the system. These information are later used by the on-host proxy. Uber's service mesh architecture center around an on-host L7 reverse proxy. It is responsible for receiving incoming RPC requests and forwarding it to the correct destination service. RPC is a protocol that enables one program to execute code in another address space, typically on a different computer or system, as if it were a local procedure call. Would anyone be interested in learning more about RPC versus REST? Please let me know in the comments below. The proxy receives traffic assignment from the traffic control system to know how to split the traffic for each service. It also uses the host information to retrieve the backend instance from the service discovery. Now that we understand the role of the on-host proxy, what is a proxy server anyways? A proxy acts as an intermediary between client's request and the server providing the response. In a reverse proxy setup, a client would make requests to the proxy server, which then forwards the request to the destination server on behalf of the client. There are many benefits to using the reverse proxy such as load balancing and security by hiding the internal structure of the backend servers from external clients. This leads us to the sponsor of this video, NordVPN. Cut cut, we're not sponsored by NordVPN. Bro, you had 8k subs. Oh Anyway, so yeah, uh, reverse proxy, please help subscribe. In order to avoid the overhead of setting up and tearing down connections with each new request, proxies typically maintain long-lived connections with backend instances. As you can imagine, as the total number of backend instances and request traffic grow, so would the maintenance cost for CPU and memory usage for establishing these connections. This is really difficult for a single proxy to manage. The backend instances are instead divided into smaller, overlapping, and manageable groups called subsets. Each subset contains a fixed number of instances. Overlapping subsets enable backend instances to belong to multiple subsets at the same time to provide flexibility and load balancing. Subsetting help alleviate the burden on proxies and backend instances by limiting the number of connections each proxy needs to maintain. Originally, they were using a default size for their subset and would override the default value if needed. However, they found that this would lead to improper load balance on some instances. Suppose that the static subset size for service B is set to 3, while there are 5 total instances. We have service A running on two different hosts, making 60 requests per second each to service B. The traffic assignment from the traffic control system says that each instance of service B should process 20 QPS each. 
In this specific scenario, one instance would have to process 40 QPS, which is double the expected traffic split. This is because this specific node of service B is part of the overlapping subset. This example shows that when the number of callers is low, it can cause both overload and underutilizations on some of the instances on service B. The next issue is when some host is making more requests than other hosts. In this example, we have three hosts. Host A has service A and D both making a combine of 210 QPS to service B. Each proxy maps to three nodes from service B, so service B node 1, 2, and 3 are now processing 70 QPS each. Host B has service A making 15 QPS to service B, and its subsets are node 2, 3, and 4, each processing 50 QPS. And host C has service D making 60 QPS to service B, with subset node 3, 4, and 5 processing 20 QPS each. As you can see here, due to the fact that host C is making fewer requests, service B node 5 is only processing 20 QPS, while the rest of the nodes are processing way more. On top of these issues, more services were being added on a regular basis and load imbalance happened all the time. I don't know about you, but needing to figure out the subset size does not sound trivial at all. They eventually looked into dynamic subsetting solution by leveraging the existing traffic control system. Each on-host proxy would periodically generate traffic load reports which contain information about the amount of traffic that is being handled to the traffic control system. The traffic control system then needs aggregators to aggregate traffic load reports for multiple on-host proxies within the same zone. Controllers that receive the aggregator report then generate a global view of the traffic distribution. This is useful for better load distribution across data center. In order to achieve the desired dynamic subsetting, the system would send back the global aggregated report back to the on-host proxies. In this example, proxy A is processing two-thirds of the overall traffic, so it can increase the subset so that more nodes from service B can help with the processing. Likewise, process B is processing fewer loads so it can decrease its subset. With the new global aggregate load, we can dynamically adjust the subsets of each proxy in real time using this formula, where the constant number controls the number of outbound connections. This whole process of generating the global aggregations and pushing it back to the proxy is done within seconds. This took about 6 months to complete. After the rollout, they noticed that 8 of their larger services reported 15-30% to reduction in CPU utilization, and some other services also reported a decrease in 40%. Just take a look at the CPU utilization after the rollout. And there's also this imbalance indicator graph. What do you think about their overall approach to load balancing? Is there any other videos or topic that you would like me to cover? Please